in this class? 20 steps to better sound? Something like that. <laughs> we'll improvise. Get free stuff? That's not the name of this class. <laughs> Get free stuff. Darn. Long road. Yeah, so this, this is my information if you don't have it and you don't want to write it down. I have business cards over there because obviously there's going to be questions after you leave here that you might want to ask. So you can email me. You can post it on my Facebook page or my Worship MD page. Uh, you can call me. Um, just don't do it in the middle of the night. And uh, if you want this PowerPoint, as I said yesterday, I'm willing to give you my presentation. All you have to do is ask for them. And I'll send you a Dropbox link because the files are too big to email. All right, so before we get into anything technical about how to make it sound better, <clears throat> anything that you ever want to do when you're working with people has to be built on relationships. Because without relationship, we, we don't communicate well with each other. Or there's conflicts, and we don't know how to resolve conflicts. But it's way better when you can be uh, in a relationship or on a team where you know what the people's abilities are and their skills. You know how to communicate to them what you need, and they can communicate back what they need. And you build stronger relationships, and the team functions better. I don't care if it's a basketball team or a worship team. It just works better that way. So, I don't know if you have your little Google Bible with you, but um, if you do, you can read along with me. I'm doing an English Standard Version of uh, Philippians 2, 1 to 11, and you can read along with me if you like. This passage shows Christ's example of humility. And I think some of us get into these areas where we know it all. You're going to do what I tell you to do. And there's times to have authority like that. There's also times to show that you are willing to learn something and be humble about it. So if there's any encouragement in Christ and any comfort from love and any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind having the same love, being in full accord in a one mind. I don't know of one team that wins championships that doesn't have that spirit of unity and having the same goal and purpose as it Even if they have disparate backgrounds and traditions, they have that goal. What's our goal in the church? What are we doing this year? Are we doing it because we want to be the best tech in the, in the world? You want to have your songs heard on thousands of Christian radio stations. Yeah. Why, why do we do this? Why do we show up as a Sunday? Right? <clears throat> do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, right. but in humility count yourselves more significant. Count others more significant than yourselves. And that's hard to do sometimes, ten minutes before a service, when some kid's yanking on your, on your shirt. You're trying to get the thing ready for the service to start, and this kid's crying over here because his father beat him up again. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who well, is in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. That's a heavy one. Jesus, the Son of God, did not count equality with the Father. You couldn't grasp that? I'm well, sure he could. But the point of this passage is that they, he, even though he was the Son of God, submitted his will to the Father for everything. And who are we submitting our will to? should be doing the same thing. And he submitted his will by uh, becoming so obedient to the point of death. So therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So in the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth. And the point of that is if you exalt yourself it says you will be what? Humble. Humble. But if you humble yourself
yourself, you'll be and the greatest of these is not the one who thinks he's a leader, it's the one who's a servant. First thing I teach my tech recruits is take water to the faucet. Find out what they need. Serve. Because it won't only serve them in the church, it will serve them in life. The guys I know who are out on tours, production crews, aren't necessarily the guys with the best talent. They're the guys who are servant hearted. Guys have a smile on their face, have a good attitude, show up early, stay late. When I'm looking for recruits, I'm not looking for the talented kid most of the time. I'm looking for the dedicated kid. I'm looking for the kid who has an open mind and wants to learn. And that's how we show up. And once we stop learning, we die. I'm 65 and I'm still learning stuff. A lot of time with the kids. So, amen. Now, how many of you have ever taken a Myers-Briggs test? Anybody know what that is? Kind of, everybody has this wired personality that we're given from God. <laughs> I'm an ENFP. I'm extroverted, I'm intuitive, I'm not really very organized. <laughs> My wife is an ESTJ, so that's the only thing we have in common. We're both extroverts. But she's like cut and run. We're going on a trip, man. She wants to know where we're staying, when we're leaving, when we're coming back. I'm more like, eh, figure it out when we get there. <laughs> Once she realized what I was all about and how I was wired, she knows how to communicate better to me, and I know how to communicate better to her. I think you need to take the time to understand what the personality types are of your team that you're working with. Even when I'm teaching you guys, or here in front of you, I should say, some of you could be teaching me a lot. I have to communicate it in such a way as it comes from different perspectives because people learn and respond differently the way it's presented. Some people are tactile. Some people are very tactile. They want to get their hands on something and move buttons, right? Haters. Some people are oral. They learn by hearing. Audiobooks. Some people are video people. They learn it better by watching it than seeing it. So if you understand how people receive information, you're information you're trying to communicate will be received better. So just don't assume that because I said it, people are getting it. Does that make sense? And once you understand how your team is wired, then the next thing you need to know how is how your system is wired. It, because communication with people is a lot like audio communication. There's a signal flow to it. <coughs> And if there's a short somewhere in that communication, you've got to figure out where it is and fix it. Just like you do when you have a conflict with somebody. There's a short now between you and you. You've got to make the connection better again. Get into the cable. Don't type boldly in an email. Call the person up or meet them at Starbucks and talk about it. It's the same with audio. I've got to make physical connections so the signal gets from here and goes to you. Audio, very simply, is ins and outs. Something comes in, and it goes out. And that's the biggest thing that confuses volunteer sound people. How do I get this thing to go in here and come out <coughs> over there? It's called routing. And a lot of people don't understand routing because they don't understand the basics of signal flow. And it's a lot like plumbing. You got a water main that comes into your house. Okay, you adjust the water main every time you want to adjust the shower? No. You have its own faucet for the shower. That's where the water comes, and you turn it on and adjust the pressure. Same with the sink, toilet, dishwasher. A mixing board is much the same way. <laughs> you got an input with a water main. It's your preamp game. Then you have faucets for the mains, all the monitors, the recording devices. Everything has its own control. <coughs> but that preamp game is basically your water. That's why we don't mix with it. <laughs> if you adjust that, you just turn the pressure up in every faucet in your house. <laughs> and if you turn it down, I got no pressure anywhere in the house. That make sense? Okay. So basically one input on channel, microphone goes into it, probably into a snake or directly into the board. The preamp gain raises the level of this small amount of microvolt voltage up to a level that the mixer can read, called line level. <coughs> you can EQ it, you can set 
send it to the channel, you can send it to an aux, you can send it to a recording device, a subgroup, all kinds of different outputs, which we'll get into in a minute. Mixer output, front of house speaker. That's about the most simple signal flow I can show you. If you don't understand signal flow, learn. Learn how your system is patched. Make a diagram of it. How do these microphones on the stage get into our mixer? When they come in the mixer, how do they go through the mixer? Where does it go out and what does it go out to? And is all that stuff labeled or not? When I pull out a console from a desk in a church and I see nothing but a rat's nest of wires back there with no labels, not good. Too bad, would you grab me my water? I think it's a Pellegrino. <coughs> I pulled out this one cable because I said, this is a channel 24 in the market. I said, okay, let's just try it in a spare channel. No, not working. Check the snake, see if it plugs in the right. Can we get in? Not getting any signal anywhere. So one thing I did notice was that the snake actually had, like on that one back there that you can see, it's all labeled. So we know what numbers are coming from the snake into the appropriate channel on the mixer. It's called serving. Yeah, it is. It's sort of hard. <laughs> And uh, this one just looked like a mic cable. It didn't look like it was part of the snake. That was my first clue that something wasn't, wasn't right. I said, so what, what is this thing plugged into then? I said, well, we thought it was plugged into the snake. I said, well, it's not because this is the snake channel over here. So I started drawing on it. 25 feet of cable. <laughs> it's plugged into another emperor. <laughs> 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 Ins don't go to ins. <coughs> outs don't go to outs. I don't know if you know this. It's also true in nature. <laughs> <laughs> they do have transgender jacks, I think. Yeah, they do. <laughs> that still is not going to work with an input. They're called chills. You still have to go an in to an out. <laughs> well, there it is. You get my point? So if you want to be organized, <coughs> make a diagram of how your church system is patched, how it gets put into the system, and how it leaves the mixer and goes out to wherever it's going to go. And make a diagram so that, God forbid, anything happens to you, the person who replaces you has an idea of how this system is laid out. And the next favor you can do for the person is actually identify everything on the board as to what it is. This output goes where? What's this subgroup go to? What does this aux go to? Oh, well, that's the worship leader, that's the drummer. So label your inputs, label your outputs. Some portable churches like I'm in, I get 14 year old girls coming to set up sometimes. They don't know patching. So on a mic stand like this, I have a piece of red tape on it. Because the microphone that goes on this stand has a piece of red tape on it. The snake has a piece of red tape on it where the cable with the red tape on it gets plugged in and on the back of the board the snake back there has a piece of red tape on that channel and on the board there's a piece of red tape on that channel. Red, 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 red. Blue, 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 blue. And we even have things like if this person is always the same person there might be a piece of red tape where this is adjusted for the right height. So now I'm looking at the mixer at the, from the mixer's position to the stage I see red mic, red. I don't have to right. think about channel 13 or what number it is. He had a good idea for scribble strips on digital mixers. We should have people's icons or faces. That'd be fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah, see that's see channel crazy. four and Doug's face. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> this is a little cell phone shot. You know, are, you, are you playing bass today? Click. I should agree. Does that make sense? Because let me tell you why all this is important. We talked about how many hours it takes to be good yesterday, right? How many hours was that again? 10,000 hours. And how many hours a week are you mixing? Two, three. Two to three, maybe one. So 50 to 150 hours a year. It's going to take you 100 years to get to 10,000. Hurry up. So my point is this. The reason we get frustrated and confused is because we don't know our systems, we don't know the layout, we don't know how to get the things <coughs> and we, it's chaos. 
So the more prepared you are, the more organized you are, if you can communicate with the people what you're going to need this Sunday in advance, not 10 minutes before a service, it's going to ease a lot of the frustration. Go in with a plan, go in prepared, and things will be a lot easier for you, especially if you know how to find the problem. You're going to have fun mixing, no doubt. That's the most fun about being a sound tech. What's not fun? Why the heck is that thing buzzing? <coughs> I just put batteries in that one. Why is it cut now? Why is the sub not working? And you're going to be fixing stuff 80% of the time. And if you don't know where to start to look, you're going to be really frustrated. You pull your hair out. <laughs> I used to have more than this. <laughs> when I was 15. <laughs> so there's an idea of a diagram you could do for your church. That's maybe a little more complicated. But it shows where everything goes. <laughs> if you don't understand the layout of your mixer and how things get in and leave, or the different paths, which are called buses, what are the buses that the signal can go through? Take the manual home and read it. Because basically, I don't want to see a sound guy, if I'm worship leading, with his head like this. For the last 10 minutes, I've been seeing if he will give me more monitor. And he's like this the whole time. Your head needs to be up. You need to be looking up there, waiting for something to go wrong, because it will. And anticipate when it creates scenarios in your mind that, what if this happened, what would I do? <clears throat> If the wireless mic stopped working, what is your backup plan? Run up there with it in battery? No, have a wired mic on a stand somewhere and point to it and let them grab it. What if the system goes out? Have a couple of portable speakers that you can power up in a minute to facilitate the service. Whatever it takes. Have some redundancies, some backups in place. Natalie's frustration too. I'm not so worried about it because if that breaks, I got something to go to. Right? If you're using rechargeable batteries, make sure they're recharged. <laughs> Want to move on? So, people wired, system wired. Troubleshoot people, troubleshoot system. Fix the people if you can. Okay. Use the right cables, please. <laughs> Make sure the cables that you're using. We looked at this monitor yesterday. I think John put it back in, but it was halfway up. So you might be back there crying. She's from. Give it to him. Did you ever walk up to the thing and just say, "This is out." <laughs> Problem with that cable is it's an instrument cable. That's a guitar cable. It's not a speaker cable. So what's going to happen to the amplifier if I use something that looks exactly like something else that isn't the right cable? You're going to fry the amp. So even though it looks like this, it might not be that. A quarter inch jack on a speaker head looks just like a quarter inch jack on a guitar cable. An XLR doesn't mean it's necessarily a balanced cable. Does everybody understand balancing? Why you use balanced cables versus unbalanced cables? What is a guitar cable? It's a high impedance, high Z, unbalanced cable. It has one conductor and a ground. Balanced cables have two conductors and a ground. When they send a signal from the stage to the mixer, there's a positive conductor and a, minus, and a negative one and a ground. So they're traveling down, they're picking up the same signal, including noise, RF, magnetic, induction, all kinds of stuff that gets picked up, radio waves, as an antenna. When it gets to the mixer, those things flip. They're flipped out of phase. So all the noise gets erased, <coughs> and your positive signal is still there, even though it started as negative. It's flipped. That's how balancing works. When you have an unbalanced cable, and I try to make a guitar go from here back to there, after about 15 feet, it's going to pick up so much noise and lose signal and gain in high frequencies. It's not usable. That's why we use direct boxes. So for acoustic guitars, sometimes keyboards have direct boxes built into them. For keyboards, electronic drums, we'll put those high-Z unbalanced signals into a direct box, which turns it into a balanced low-Z signal, 
and I can run that 300 feet, 400 feet, <coughs> without picking up any noise. Everybody with me? That's what a direct. So don't try to make high Z things go further than they need to because it'll be noisy and won't work. I won't go too much into direct boxes, but this is what one looks like. One of my favorites, it's a radial engineering, J48, one of my favorites, yeah. Countryman, <coughs> Jensen. There are some good inexpensive ones too. Active and passive direct boxes can both do essentially the same thing, but active is going to really maintain your signal integrity. They'll give you some little switches like the high pass filter, maybe a pad. Sometimes you get too much signal into your mixer, so you can pad it. Pad it means it's going to drop down the level enough so you can play with the preamp. Yes? Active direct boxes go into guitars that don't have their own power supply as well, correct? What's that? An active direct box would go into a guitar that doesn't have its own power supply, like a, uh, a bass, uh, an electric bass guitar. No, you can use you can use them with, with anything really. The, the difference with an active is it's it's got power in it, so it's either going to be powered by a phantom power like a condenser mic, or it's going to have a battery in it. But I can take a I don't even buy power supply in an electric guitar with. Well, like uh, in, in a lot of the acoustic guitars, they there's a nine volt battery that goes into them in order yeah. to power the mic that's inside. Yeah. Martin guitar guy, and we have a lot of uh, pickups that have batteries in them. I put them into active direct boxes a lot. Of so you can, okay. can't substitute, by the way, if, if what you're saying is, is that I'm not going to put a battery in my guitar and I'm going to allow the direct box to do that. No, it doesn't work like that. Right, no, 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 it's not. It wasn't that it was a signal flow issue. That, that <clears throat> that now, some, I will say that some guitars have a balance line out already. That might be what you're talking about. So if that's the case, and it's a balance line now, it will have two rings on the quarter-inch jack, not one ring, like a guitar cable. That means it's balanced line level, as opposed to a balanced XLR cable, okay. like this. See the two rings? Yes. One ring? Yes. Now, this could also be a stereo headphone jack, or, which or isn't balanced. So you, again, you got to make sure what's inside. Take the jack part, look at the cables. How do you know if a guitar is balanced or not? How do you know if it is? Yeah. The guitar owner would probably know if, if that particular pickup, because you, you, you would have to pay a lot of extra money for that. Okay. Right. Just so like there's some keyboards now that actually have direct boxes built right into right. them. See XLRs or balanced line outputs. For interfaces? Oh, that's a good question. Um, typically not, because a lot of the interfaces that I'm familiar with have their own balanced outputs, either line level or XLR. Even a lot of mixers now are, are interfaces. So, um, now if it's some small, inexpensive thing, maybe not. So they do have direct boxes for like computer outputs or your phone. So to balance that, to put it into a mixer. Not all mixers do. Yeah, if, if the mixer is like interface itself, so you don't well, need a direct box. Well, the direct box is more for the source more than it is for the actual mixer. For acoustic guitars, for electronic devices, uh, so that you can balance a lot of devices like a computer or your phone. They're not balanced outputs, but you want to make your computer go 300 feet to a mixer. So we put it into a direct box. It's specifically for computers. Output would go into it, and then two XLR outputs would come out of it and go to the mixer. Pretty much all mixers are running on balanced inputs, whether they're line level or XLR, that I know of. But for interface, it's not necessary. Right. Can I add anything to that? Uh, no, I, my, I think that what you were getting at was is that uh, what maybe he's asking is, is it necessary to have this thing in between? And I think that's an unnecessary piece. It's going to add unnecessary noise. Right. Unless you have that amazing Marcus Berry thing that you want to use, and that is your sound. Right. Then your interface will be capturing that particular right. sound. Right. 
Otherwise, no, it's, it, you, you don't, it's an unnecessary piece because it's going to add to the noise. Absolutely. Um, back to the power direct boxes. Um, on an electric based guitar, or do you feel that you get a better sound from a power direct box versus uh, a passive direct box? It depends on who's making the passive one. I've had some really good luck with some you know, whirlwind makes it easy. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, I think Pro Clone makes a good one. If, you know, uh, the, the B word one, not so much. <laughs> Where if you see something on mono price for $18, uh, that's what it's worth. Probably not. <laughs> but actives always work well for, for all, all the way across. Pretty much. Yeah. Now, some base amps actually have direct box built right in them. I just made a recording last week in Trebek in Nashville. Bass player had a, a direct out, and then we also mic'd up his cabinet. So we had two, but the direct sound was awesome. And, uh, all I needed. <laughs> all, all of our guitars are on direct. Good. Yeah. Are they using modeling, <clears throat> amp modelers at all? Are they using real amps? Or? So they're not using any amps. They're using straight into our system. Correct. Okay. So be prepared. That's all I'm, I guess I'm saying. Label everything. Communicate with each other what you'll need. I don't want to hear from the worship leader on Saturday night that the high school choir is coming tomorrow morning to sing. <laughs> because for one, I don't even have that many microphones. I could have got them if you called me earlier. And I don't have them to sort my board out, so because of the channel we have already used up, how am I going to submix that into the... So give me some advanced warning, will you? For the lady who walks up to you and she has your CD. And she goes, now I'm singing a special this morning. Oh, really? Oh yeah, yeah. He called me last night. Wants me to sing a song I just wrote. And the CD is a, it's got a sharpie on it. You know, and not something you buy in a store, obviously. And I said, um, "What are you singing this?" Oh, right now. She's walking to the platform. No mic up there for her yet, so I got to grab that. And as we're talking, I said, "So what track is it?" And she goes, uh, Thirty-five. Yeah. 30, 40. One of those. Just that one. Yeah. And this is a. Oh, I forgot to tell you. This is a funeral. <laughs> and uh, the song that she told me it was was actually this really quick, fast, cool song. You know, for a funeral. <laughs> What's everybody do when they see the sound man play the wrong song? Uh, everybody looks at him. Oh, what an <laughs> idiot! Don't you know this is Uncle Johnny's funeral? <laughs> he only gets one. <laughs> so if you can be a little bit more prepared, give me a little bit more notice, I'll be fine. Just talk to me. Got the boxing ball thing in. Oh, <laughs> we talked about mics a lot yesterday, so I don't want to go over a microphone, but after yesterday's class, I think you get a maybe a, a clearer view of what mics work best for what things. Even if it's just like close mics with dynamics and condensers for further away. We can use a lot of different mics for different applications, but choose mics that are right for the application. If you, if you choose a mic for a kick drum, they make mics for kick drums. <laughs> you know, you might pick a mic that's great for flute, literally a kick drum, but it might take a little bit more work to get it to sound like it's for a kick drum. Right? Yeah. Vocal mics usually work well for vocals. <laughs> well, it has a lot to do with EQing to them. Learn more about mics. I have some more books. If you weren't here yesterday, if you were out of books, just email me and I'll send you some resources on microphones that you can. <coughs> hey, you just made a good point there. You were talking about a microphone and an EQ. And the best microphone requires the least amount of EQ for mm -hmm. whatever your application is. That's why a Sennheiser 441 is great for trombones because it actually hits those particular notes. And, and so it's about the microphone. Is that the microphone that stretches? It's the Stevie Dicks microphone. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, it stretches. We're just having fun up here. I hope you don't mind. It's been a long weekend. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have a brass reducing microphone? Uh, 
What's that? A brass ribs. Some microphones. Uh, brass ribs. <laughs> uh, we have a banjo silent. Okay. Yeah. Okay, this is important, guys, because I've, I've been in churches that haven't done sound checks for years. Remember, I was mentioning the preamp game thing before. That's essential uh, in setting that so the amount of voltage that this microphone, this particular specific microphone, is sending you is optimized. I want to make sure that that signal is not too hot or too cold. There's a point at which you're not getting enough signal, and you'll hear the background noise of the device itself. It's called salt noise, and every electronic device produces it. That's why you see a spec in an electronic device that says S forward slash N, signal to noise ratio. <laughs> and the better that spec is, the cleaner the device is. But it's still going to produce something. I don't care how clean it is. You got to get the signal above that and below the point where you have no more headroom left. There's a threshold at which point it's going to distort. So you want to try to get the, the talent, the singers, the guitar players, the drummers, to give you enough signal at their loudest level so you can adjust it so it doesn't peak out and distort. Right? And if you don't take the time to do that, you're going to have not a very good mix. You're going to be fighting it the whole time. And some people do sound checks differently. If you're at a festival, there's really no time to sound check a band. That band is off, the next band is on. So you're looking at all your trims up here and adjusting because the lights are all goofy. So you're doing it all at the same time. But if you have time in the church, it would be nice to optimize each mic individually and take the time to do that. In the old rock and roll days, Rob and I would probably start with kick drums, absolutely, and work all the way up through to a lead singer because we had big rigs, lots of subs, lots of PA. Churches, not so much. They're still starting with PK. So by the time they get to the lead vocal, there's nothing wrong. Because they're spending 20 minutes on a kick drum. And the talent's all up on the stage waiting for the guy to get his compressor and his EQ right for something that isn't that critical, to tell you the truth. <laughs> Does anybody leave your church service humming the kick drum? <laughs> 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 I'd love to see a church someday do that though. That was yeah, I got so much out of that. I did too. I'll be back next week. That was good. So what's the, what's the most important microphone in the system? The vocal. I mean, you might have a 16 channel, 24 channel, 30. I don't care what. What if you had a one channel PA system? In your what would be a lead vocal? So why don't we start there? Why don't we spend the time on the thing that's the priority instead of the thing that isn't? So get the lead vocalist out there, have her sing a cappella in about a voice that's loud. <coughs> you might have to tease her to get her up to the level you need it. And close your eyes and say, is she loud enough in the room right now? <coughs> might be a dumb question, but I just wondered. Um, you know, with wireless mics, you have throwing settings. Um, would you set the mics to a standard? So like we have Sennheiser Gen 2s and 3s, and then we also use the new audio tech that does things like that. Those, those don't have as much, they have a little knob or whatever. Would you set them to a standard and then set your gains off of that? Or because you know you understand what I'm making sense because I don't know the tech words. Yeah, like, and then even some characters have a trim right inside of them. Right. Would you set those at a I'd probably start them all around two o'clock. Around 2 o'clock, that's what I'm saying. 12 to 2 o'clock, and then right. start from there. Exactly. The idea of inputs to outputs, if I have an input that's coming in and it's overdriving something, i got to pad it down here. Right. The next stage it goes to, if I'm getting distortion, i got to pad it down here. Right. So it's called unity. Right. You want to try to keep things around the same right. kind of level. Right. Even with speakers, people do it so backwards sometimes. They'll get all their board optimized. Right. So, you know, your, your faders, we'll get this in a minute. Your faders are around the sweet spot of where they should be. They're not low on the dirt. They're not way up. Right. They're somewhere about two thirds of the way up, around unity somewhere. And then your master should also be able to be around there. I find some church I go into, this kind of might be right, but they got the master down to like minus forty, and it's blasting the room out. Why? 
because they haven't optimized the attenuators on their amplifier to suit this. So they can get this up to where it should be, and now it's the right level for the room because I've attenuated the amplifiers, right? Well, don't do that. <coughs> you know, when you see the fader thing I'll put up in a minute, you'll see how it's not linear. It's not an even from top to bottom. There's an area of the fader that gives you a lot more ability to adjust to minor things. And uh, if you're not there, you're going to have a hard time. So my point is just this. Get the talent to, per to perform at full volume. Set the level where you need it to be so it's not distorting, it's not too low. And once you get the singer right, what's the next thing I do? Kick drum. <laughs> because I look at a mix like a pyramid. Pyramid, I got the top priority mic here. What's at the base of the pyramid, the foundation? Really? What's at the base? Kick drum, bass, guitar. <laughs> The bass guitar, the kick drum, the low frequency, the fundamental foundation that musicians need to stand on so it holds together. That thing is flimsy and not strong, it falls apart. Musicians don't know how to play with something that they can't feel. It doesn't have to stop your pacemaker, but it has to be present. <laughs> and then I'll do things in combination. After the kick, I might do the bass guitar because I like mixing kick with bass. I mix them as though they're like one instrument. What might be doing the attack, what might be doing the fundamental or opposite. You gotta choose which one, they can't be both doing the, the same thing. They both can't be boosted at 80 hertz, okay? That's not gonna work. <laughs> Anytime that you boost a frequency, getting a little off track on the EQ, if I boost the bass guitar 3 dB at 80 hertz, and I boost the kick drum 3 dB at 80 hertz, what's 80 hertz in my system right now? 6 dB. It adds up. It builds up. And what is room? You gotta make cuts where you're making boost. You gotta make it complementary. What's an octave above 80? 160. So maybe instead of boosting 80 on the bass guitar, I'll boost 160 and cut 80. And on the kick drum, I'll boost 80 and cut 160. So now they do this. Your vocals, don't make all the vocals the same EQ. Make them slightly different. Because if you make them all the same, they're all going to build up, build up, build up, or cut, cut, cut. And you're going to need deep holes and you're going to need big mountains of boost. So make them slightly different. Does that make sense? What you're saying makes sense. Not with the way it is in a radio today. Right. Yeah. And it's just that the right. mixes are terrible. Mm -hmm. They really are. And I mean, I listen to that and I know I sound like old guy. <laughs> <laughs> But what he's talking about is, is absolutely, completely fundamental, and, and it's just not a, a today practice. But I believe everything is cyclical, and it'll all come back around. And we're also talking about live sound, too, because these things develop in a room with a bunch of musicians playing. I have a and word. I, I, it's called unoffensive. You have to, especially with what we do, okay, we're trying to, you, and you can't, you can't please everybody, we know that. But you have to <coughs> truly go at this thing as it's completely unoffensive. In other words, if you did work on that lead vocal and you do have it loud and, and hot louder than everything, don't have it so loud that everybody goes, oh, wow. Yeah, no. You know, it can't be painful. It has to be mixed music. Right. How many of you who are sound people actually love music? Hope so. He doesn't. He doesn't love, he, he love you. don't love music? <laughs> I can get it. <laughs> I'm not saying you have to be a musician, but if you're not listening to a lot of music and passionate about it, you're never going to mix music with it. But things have to blend in, as he says. You can't have, like, I see it happen with special all the time. The track is coming through the system so softly, and the vocal is so loud. Bring up the track. I bring it. Should the track be over top of the vocal, or the vocal be over top of the track? The vocal's always going to be on top. But, but if you're and talking about trans Unless you long, can't sing. Unless, right. <laughs> <laughs> as, as long, as I mean, it's not a stupid question, but... No, but as long as you're yeah. going there, also, please, get the best inter uh, interpretation. If you're going to have to use tracks, get the best thing. Don't be like he just said. Don't be going and, mm -hmm, we're going to do this live off of YouTube as it comes along. Right. We're going to rely on our stream or something right. like that. Get, take the time to get something better. I hate the fact that, first of all, I hate using tracks, but if you're going to... Um, don't 
get this track that is this loud and the next track is this loud. And then, and then your sound man is back there scrambling going, what? You know, we went from this track to this track and then all of a sudden the third track is back up again. What? We're not Superman? No. <laughs> That also happens with keyboard patches, you probably know this, where a keyboard guy will have this particular patch at a certain volume and you set the level for that. Yeah. But then he goes into his uh, nuclear apathy patch. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Armageddon, you know. What the heck was that? Right. You know, try to get him to normalize. When, when you master a record, when somebody submits an artist 15 songs to a mastering engineer, one of the jobs of a mastering engineer is to normalize the levels between the songs. So they all have a flow. It's all consistent. We need to do that in church too. Make sure our levels are kind of the same one to the other. And you're going to bump it up for fast songs. I get it. Maybe pull it back a little bit for the softer ones. But keep that in mind. Try to keep levels, especially from sources, kind of the same. Guitar players are guilty of it too with their pedals. You know. So anyway, so this is a fader here. Can we see it? Familiar with that? And uh, certain points of fader, about two thirds of the way up, you're going to see either a zero or a U. That's called unity. <coughs> a lot of people think, wow, that fader's up pretty high. Yeah, you know what that fader's at right now? It's not changing the signal one bit. <laughs> Whatever you adjusted from the preamp, it's coming in unaffected. So I usually have my faders around that point when I'm adjusting the preamp. Because at this point, I'm not cutting or boosting the signal. If you're adjusting the preamp gain with it down here, you're probably going to give it too much. And if you adjust it with it above this point, you're probably not going to give it enough. <coughs> that makes sense? <coughs> so, what you also notice is it's not linear. You might not see the bottom numbers here. <coughs> this is minus 90, and the next one above it, which is about this high, is minus 60. So in this little space, there's a 30 dB spread. <laughs> Try to do a minor adjustment with that little bit of movement. You can't. You've got to be up in what's called the sweet spot of the fader. From here to here, 10, 5, 15. This is 20 dB of spread. You have a lot of room to make boost and cuts. Minor adjustments that aren't going to affect the, the mix negatively. So that's kind of like the area. I'm not saying you have to keep these at unity. I see a lot of people <coughs> keeping it here and mixing with the trims. Don't do that because you just boosted the monitor for the worship leader or you cut or <coughs> you So use these appropriately where you need to. Does that make sense? Okay. <coughs> this is a channel strip. This is a made up channel strip. I don't care what mixer you guys have. I work for a pre -sonus. But I'm not here to teach a pre -sonus. I want to teach you what the terminology is on a mixer that you're going to be running into. And then, where is that particular thing on my mixer? Every mixer has faders for their names, pretty much. They have auxes, subgroups, EQ, different sorts, phantom power, polarity switches. All mixers pretty much have the same kind of detail to that stuff. But where is it on your mixer? If it's a digital mixer, you might have to find it in a menu somewhere. If it's an analog mixer, it might be right in front of you, but still, where is it here? You know what I liken it to? When I'm renting cars from Hertz. So this week, I happen to have a Maximum. Last week I had a Chrysler. Chrysler has a transmission on a pot. The Maximum has it on a fader. <laughs> the wipers are on the right side of the Chrysler. They're on the left side of the mask. Where are the headlights? So all cars have the same stuff, but where is it on this car? Right? And that's a trick when you're in a different car every day, trying to keep up with it, especially in a rainstorm where you can't find the wipers. <laughs> in Florida. <laughs> so I'm here to teach how to drive and what the instrument panel should look like on any mixer. <coughs> so if you don't know what auxes are, what are auxes for? What is an aux? Has anybody heard the word bus before? What's a bus? 
Anybody know what a bus is? Who doesn't know what a bus is? You all know what a bus is. So you don't know or you do know? I know. I know. Okay. All a bus is is a, a line, basically. I get on the bus here and I get off the bus here. Just like a school bus. So an aux is a bus. I can take a signal into my mixer and send it to the main system bus. I can send it to an aux bus, which could be a monitor on a stage. I can send it to a post-fade aux bus, which would be an effect, reverb, delay, or an aux fed subwoofer. I can send it to a recording device. Subgroups, that's a bus. That can go to delay speakers. They can go to an external processor. So. Those are all outputs and inputs. Inputs get to assign to a bus, and the bus leads it to a destination. That's all it is. Just like a real bus. Except this. Here's where the analogy breaks down. I can get on a bus, but can I send myself on five different buses? Oh, that's true. Not yeah. yet. Maybe right. in a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> I need to know what bus I don't know about that naming stuff. <laughs> okay, so. All this stuff is pretty much on your mixer. I don't care what mixer it is. Maybe not as many, maybe more of something, like boxes. This only has four boxes. And you'll notice that some of them can be pre-fade or post-fade. What does pre-fade mean? Before the fade. Right. So if I'm soloing up some instrument because I hear something weird going on stage, I can hit the PFL button or a solo button on some mixers it's called, and I can listen, and it doesn't matter where the fader is, I'll still hear the signal. It's before the fader. Now when I'm sending a monitor signal <coughs> to the stage, for any of the musicians up here, I'm going to send it pre-fade. Why? Because the fader will adjust the house, but it won't adjust your monitor. That's right. They're independent. I can adjust the level for his monitor separately from what I'm doing. What if you're in a small team? And the monitors that you're using, you're not using in your ears, you're using, like for instance, this is and your monitors are at a level that it, I think you're doing special. And the special ends, solos ends, and you need to fade out. And you fade out, but yet the music still is playing. So now you've got a bunch of luck going through your house because all the, all the houses here now is monitors. Would you, would you say that you still want to stay? But you don't have, you don't have the track going on an independent bus like that. If you pull it down. You would have your you're track. Not, you're, not more, you're not going to be any more signal or monitoring because the track stops, right? Well, no. Like, for instance, okay, a lot of times tracks have extra whatever that's called at the end of the song. And the, the, the singers will cut off earlier than what the track does, so you fade out of that. So you don't use that clean presentation. Yeah. But if the monitors are pre fader that music's still playing on the, on the stage, and the house is still hearing it, but yet the house is still... I would just hit the stop button. <laughs> but, then, but, then, but then you lose your, your effect of fading out. Yeah. You know what? You, that's a very unique situation, and you might try something like just pulling the preamp down, just yeah, right. toning it down. Well, that's but, what I run into. You it's kind of hard to. Yeah. I mean, for that particular, you might want to put post fade for something like that. I do run post fade because I, I battle that with. But, sound but typically for Mars, you don't want to ever do post fade. You don't. Because do. you might have the track at a level here, and as soon as you're adjusting the track for the house, you just put it up on a monitor too. Right. No, I, yeah. I, I, yeah. right. If you've ever seen the look of your singer's face <laughs> when, when you bring something up and they didn't expect it, you, you're, right. you know, that's mm -hmm. not, But you're, you're talking about this much of the time. Oh, agreed. You know? agreed. I mean, even if it was, if you're talking about that much of the time and that your sound source is your phone, use your phone as the, as the start bringing the volume down on your phone or, the, or your iPad or whatever, you know, the other, other devices. But I wouldn't go so far as to just go ahead and flip everything into post fade. Well, it's mainly just the tracks more than anything when you're running track. Now, you don't know, your, your issue is pretty clear, but I was just asking. Was yeah. it correct? I, was, I wasn't No, no, yeah. I, 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 I get the application. Like, yeah. yeah. But it, it might forget to turn it off post fade when they go through to do their set. That's the problem, you know? So, you know who used to, the Partners family used to fade out all the time on their TV show. Is this like a Partners family thing? Sure. <laughs> yeah, we're on. We're on the Partners family. Sounds good to me. I'll get into subgroups later, and post-fade just is, you would use a post-fade on an aux, like for a subwoofer, for instance. I raise the level of the aux, and the pop <coughs> increase to the sub-two. 
Um, but I use it mainly for external processing. Right? Reverb, delay. I'm not talking about compressors. That would be something else. But reverb, delay, any of those kind of things. That would be post fade because if you have a guitar going to a delay, you want the delay to track with the movement of the, of the guitar. You don't want just delay and just guitar by itself. You want to have them go together. Use a talk back mic because it's better than yelling at the stage. I don't care how far away you are. Johnny, turn your guitar down, man. And Johnny has an attitude now because you're yelling at him. He thinks you're mad at him. Doug is such a jerk, man. You have talk back mic. Hey, Johnny, turn your guitar on a little bit. Thanks. Or come up there and hit you with this microphone. <laughs> As long as it's polite, you say thank you at the end. Yeah, the other reason for a talkback mic, probably not used as often, is you know, certain applications. Maybe, but, you know, it's really nice if the pastor's talking about a passage in Luke and you don't agree with it. You can go, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure about that interpretation. I don't, know last night, I, don't, I don't get the same meaning. That's, that's not what he says at all. <laughs> yeah. Get some headphones. I prefer you get audio technique headphones. <laughs> Don't get Dr. Dre or Beats, okay? Those things are not for accuracy. They're for casual listening. They bump up the bottom and bump up the top. They're loud. They're vending machine headphones. What do you want? But you need something that's more neutral, actually. And um, there's two reasons I really would like you to have headphones. One is to solo things up during the performance so you don't have to pull every fader down until you find it. <laughs> um, so, Put the cans on, solo. I just had a situation where a microphone had dipped into the hi hat because nobody tightened the stand down. So it just went like this and hit the hi hat, and I hear this nasty distortion. I didn't know what it was at first until I soloed it. Once I soloed it and knew what it was, I'm not going to go up there and fix it like a roadie, sneak on the stage. <laughs> Remember Chevy Chase? Yes. <laughs> I'm just going to mute it. Mute it for the rest of the service. And then yell at the kid who didn't tighten it. <laughs> the other reason is for reference. So a lot of touring engineers, they have their repertoire of music on their hard drive that they'll always play to listen to the system in a new venue. I'm in Madison Square Garden last night. I'm in the Orange County Convention Center tonight. It's different. What stays the same? My music on my headphones. These travel with me. I know what this, this music sounds like all the time with these, but it sounds different in this room. So what they do is they put them on, they listen, they take it off and listen and go, ooh, that's really different. <laughs> okay, I need some adjustments here. Here's the point, you're never gonna get it perfect. You can get it closer, but this becomes an A to the B reference. So it's always a good thing to have. Get familiar with certain tunes and you know how it would sound in a lot of different speakers. When we're mixing a record, Rob can talk about this. How many different monitors do you mix a record with? In the, well, you have to have three, at least in the room, and then a set of headphones. And in the old days, we used to start with uh, these things, they were called oratones. Do you remember those? The little guys. They were the worst sounding speakers in the world, and if you could get it to sound good there, then you were doing really well. Then you worked yourself up to probably the most popular near field monitors in the world would have been John's uh, NS10s. Uh, the Yamaha NS10s were probably the most sold near field monitors in the world, and then everybody had a different opinion about far field monitors, but that's where you get your low end, and that's where you get the field of it. So if you're bouncing between one, two, and three, and you got your headphones, you're doing pretty well. Another thing that we used to do, funny enough, was run off a mix and go out to a car. Car stereo. You know, to try and, try and get that. So if you could get that, but it, I mean, as many reference points as you can get, but definitely the, the Aura Tones, and, that, and the NS10s too, although a lot we, of people. We even had a clock radio in our studio. Oh, yeah, going through there. Sure. Wow, that, wow, that was awful. Yeah. That is Look at Yuri's back on. <laughs> That's terrible. I hope nobody's listening on those. That's what it was. I'll wake up to that. Tame the stage. You're never going to get a clean house mix unless you get this tamed. We talked about that a lot last night. I've been right here. I'm sorry, but um, we can go more into monitoring today if you want to talk to me offline about what you can do to tame your monitors and get the musicians to play at a level that's appropriate for the house. Get them to hear the house, get them to hear the room, move things around so people aren't offended by this loud thing, they can go over there. People can't hear it and get closer to it. 
don't discount moving things. It helps. Um, personal linear monitors will really clean up your FOH units, but it, it takes a while to get used to them. So don't try to transition this week to next week in yours. Take your time with it. Get used to the comfort. Know what your budget can afford you. There's lots of ways to get it in here that won't break the bank. But what it will do, the biggest benefit will be the congregation. And it will also help musicians protect their hearing if they use them appropriately. <coughs> okay, subgroups. We talked about this briefly yesterday. I don't want you mixing with inputs. I don't want you mixing even with this little 16 channel console. If you have to bring the levels of the drums down, you want to pull eight faders down, and then when you want them to go back to the level they were at before, try to put them back to all the same level they were before you pulled them down. Assign them to a subgroup, and control all eight drums with one, or a stereo group, one fader. Put your guitars on another one, put your background vocals on another one. Depending on how many subgroups you have, is how many ways you can divide those things up so you can control the mix with less <coughs> faders rather than more. You can imagine how cumbersome this would be if I had 96 inputs. You won't see one touring engineer ever not use DCAs or subgroups. It's all this. I can mix a whole show with two subgroups. Band and vocal. I can do the whole thing like this. So when the band starts to overwhelm the lead vocalist, pull the band fader down. Now you're in the vocals again. Not 48. Do you, do you separate the instruments to the stereo channel and then your all your vocals on the phone? Depends. I mean, something like this. I put my lead vocal right here on this fader. So here's my lead vocal and here's the rest of my instruments. So this is not even in a subgroup. Sometimes I'll keep a lead vocal on its own DCA for its own effects and stuff. Do you know what DCAs are? Who doesn't know? Okay. So you'll see on a lot of digital boards this term DCA, it's digitally controlled amplifier. Let's get one thing straight. Subgroup is a bus, a DCA is not a bus. Subgroup, I can send a signal somewhere. I can send it to a delay speaker, a front fill, under balcony. DCA can't do anything like that. All the DCA is is a remote control for a group of channels to make them go up and down. So if you just want to control level, the DCA is your choice. If you want to take a group of drum mics and put a compressor on the drum set, you need a subgroup to do that. <laughs> if I want to send a mix to the front fills or a mix to the back, I can use a matrix and send it to a subgroup output. I can delay the output in the back of the room so the time arrives at the right time versus the mains. You can't do any of that with the DCA. Old analog boards used to call these things VCAs, voltage control amplifier, digital to digital control. But some groups existed on both of them. So most mixers have both <coughs> if they're digital. They have DCAs and subgroups. Use them where they need to be used. Does that make sense? What, what do you use? Which one do you use? So on this particular one, this is a, an earlier version of a pre summons mixer, <coughs> similar to something you might have. This one did not have DCAs, so if I wanted to group anything on this board, I had to use a subgroup. I didn't have a choice. But if you have a choice and you just want to control levels of a group of things, you don't need to process that group with a with a processor like a compressor or a reverb or something, they don't to use a DCA because you just want to control the level of it. So you assign tracks to group and then they Yeah, you assign the you assign the channels you assign the channels to a group. And then the group you assign to the main. The channels do not get assigned to a group and the main. It's one or the other. <laughs> Unless you're doing a subgroup that's going somewhere, then you can do that. But what you want to do is take the drums, assign them to the subgroup only, and then the subgroup gets the same as the main output. Because if they're doubled up, you're going to get more output and also possibly some distortion. So DCAs don't have anything to do with that part of it. So all you're doing is raising or lowering levels of those things. And if you don't have the levels right, because they're all set at unity, but if this was down here and this was up here and this was down here, even though I do this, it's going to do all the relative levels of those. And if you have to bump the kick up, then just push the kick up. And then go back to mixing with your groups again. <laughs> Does that make sense? 
make sense? It'll make your job so much easier if you have less things to think about, especially the more inputs that you get. 32 inputs, I got four guitars and eight drums and three keyboards and four background vocalists. And now the lead vocalist can't be heard, so we try to do all these individual things. It's easier just to go over here and do this. Or not? You still want to mention that? <laughs> Use your mutes. First talk about communicating with your worship leader about how the songs are going to go this week. You're lucky if you get a song list. I get it. But if you had some extra notes in there, like when we do 10,000 Reasons this week by Matt Redman, we're going to have the intro just acoustic guitar. It's usually the whole band. We're just going to have acoustic guitar because we're coming off of a song that has a full band, and I want to give the congregation a break and just have acoustic. So be ready for that. And on the first verse, I'm going to add a lead vocal to it. None of the band is playing yet in the first verse. On the second verse, I'm going to have keyboard and a djembe in the background. That's it. Not the whole band yet. No background vocals. This is all written on my notes to the sound man. Why? Because now the sound man doesn't have to have every mic <coughs> when only an acoustic guitar is playing. And I know I can mute just about every microphone on the stage until the first verse when the lead vocal is on. Unmute the lead vocal just before the first verse. Unmute the keyboard and the djembe before the second verse. And on the chorus, the full band comes in, unmute everything. Why do I want to mute those things during the service? Because if you have microphones sitting on the stage just waiting to be used, they're going to ring feedback. It keeps your system clean, tight, no ringing, no extra mics being turned on for no reason. So don't just use your mutes at the end of the service when the pastor speaks. You can use them in the service. If you're paying attention, the microphone on the wireless saxophone <coughs> guy, and he's walking around a monitor like this. What? He's not playing right now. Mute him. Yeah, when are you going to unmute him? Do you know what he's going to play exactly? What bar of he's coming in on? If you're paying attention and looking at the stage, you'll know when he's going to play. How? <laughs> he does that a lot. Because he can't play very well. So he's, he's not good. I've heard and, and now that he knows that I know that, he, he does it on purpose just to trick me. He goes, it, it, it's called sandbag. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, and he goes, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Is there any real advantage of muting them over just shading? Everyone. Uh, is there any advantage of a muting? Because you can forget to turn something on. Yeah. Or you could just gate them. Have gates on. Yeah, gates. I, I'd rather <coughs> use gates. I'd rather mute. I mean, if gates work for drums sometimes, especially for drummers that don't know how to play. Gates work great. I can beat the whole drum set. <laughs> but if you got a guy who's playing like one level, we put him in a cage like that. Those guys are easy to gate because they don't have any dynamic range. You have a jazz drummer who does ghost rolls. Where's the threshold? Same with singers. They're whispering because it's a, it's a powerful emotional song. They're whispering the words and they belt into the chorus. That's hard to gate too. You can try downward expanders, which work a little bit better than a gate. It's, just, it's a gate, but it works in a different way, kind of. But I try to avoid gates as much as I can because you get jitter at the threshold in the way. Where the thing doesn't play at all. And the sax player, you know, he can play soft, he can play loud. So again, I'm just going to try to watch when he's going to play and get a clue from that. And if I know the song well enough, I'll know when he's going to come in. Just being prepared again, paying attention. I think you just nailed it. The, the thing that I try to tell everybody that's in the booth is that if there's five musicians on stage, you're the sixth musician. You're the next person in the group. You have to know the songs as well as the bass player, <coughs> the drummer, and everybody else. You can't, this is... You may think this is some sort of voluntary job and you get to check your emails and, and watch your phone while this is happening. 
And you need to know the song as well as everybody on stage yeah. because you need to know those cues. One of my biggest pet peeves, you guys are going to hate me, whatever. I hate I hate music standards up on stage. It's, it's disengaging. It's not what I want to see. And it's like he said, if, if, I, if I'm mixing in front of house, and I'm, and I'm the worship leader up on stage, and I'm looking at my, my front of house guy, and he just always has his head down, I have a strong opinion that he's not really paying attention to me. Well, what about if I'm the worship leader and my head's always down? What about that same opinion, right? So it would be great if we could all learn the material, and I mean the front of house guy too, and then we all, then this person that's in the booth is the next person in the band. Then there's no excuse. Just bring up an auxiliary point. Go ahead. I can't hear my monitor. Where is it? Oh, I love it. <laughs> I'm over here, Doug. I can't hear my monitor. Oh, wait a minute. The music step. Oh, oh, can you mute your music? <laughs> oh, I hear it great now. Awesome. It's called an organic fix. <laughs> Kent Morris had this trick. Remember Kent? So he would say, what Rob was just alluding to is somebody's way off axis of thing. We talked about dispersion yesterday. So this guy's over here, and the monitor's not even aimed at his ears. Right. It's not aimed at any part of his body. And he can't hear the thing. So well, turn it little, up. Take a little orange decal <laughs> and put it right in the middle of where the horn would come out. And you ask the guy, can you see the orange dot? What, what orange dot? On your monitor. Go look for it. Oh, yeah, I see it. You could stand there. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yeah, he's right. I didn't have to How move. do you do the mind control on them? The mind control. Yeah. He went over that earlier. It's called coffee I, or fellowship. I think that there's nothing better than, than food or, or coffee to actually bring the team together. I know he agrees with this, too. Because a lot of that uh, massaging needs to happen away from your venue. Oh, yeah. You know, there's there's a lot of tension that can be built up on this stage in this room in front of the house. A whole lot of tension, and all of a sudden, now you have two teams. You don't have you don't have one that's being unified. You've got the guys in the booth, and you got the guys in the stage. So I mean, that's a really good point, which he, he did go over. But not very well. It, 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 it is about. It, it's not necessarily politics, Doug. It's about team building. Team building, right? But I think, I think a lot of times for me, it's the relationship, back to what was original statement was, the relationship with my singers, as well as them trusting me. If they don't trust me to, to give them what they need, then, or what, how they hear out here. Well, he did give you a good, a, a good way to do that, is start with bringing water up to the platform. I, I mean, that, you know, if I'm up on the platform, I'm going to notice that somebody's taking care of me, somebody's, you know, they're actually caring, they're planning. Uh, it's a good way to start your relationship. He's exactly right. You know, much, much of this stuff, and we talk about this all the time, is organic. Yeah. It just simply is. There's right. not a knob to fix attitudes. Well, again, I didn't really stress it enough, I don't think, but I can solve more problems relationally than I can technically. So you're, your name's Lee, right? Yes. So you're my, you're my guitar player. But pretend I don't know your name. Okay. And it's the first time you played in my church, and I'm the sound guy, and I don't know your name. <coughs> and you're, you, brought, you brought your Marshall stack in right here, and you think it's cool, and you're showing me how you play Eruption. <laughs> and I go, man, your guitar got to come down, man. Because you're blowing, I, I got you completely out of the mix. And you're, not, that's all I hear. So, you do that for me, please? Thank you. And I walk away. I'm a jerk. Just offended you. Your tone is awful. You heard things that I wasn't even saying, but now you're ticked at me, right? But now, Oh, yeah. Your name's Lee. We've been hanging out. We went to Starbucks. We came over to my house for a cookout. We're listening to Eruption together the right way to be played. <laughs> <laughs> Mess up with guitar. You have to put your kids' names, where you work, what you like to do for hobby. And we're friends now. And this particular day, you bought your Marshall and again, and you said, I better not bring the Marshall. I better bring my little box AC-15. I go, Lee, it's so low out. Can you do me a favor? And you say, Sure. Can you turn it down a little bit? There you go. That's a relationship. That's how it works. <coughs> I didn't have to make a conflict. I didn't have to try to do anything to because I couldn't do anything anyway, technically. Anybody ever been in a situation where something's just so loud 
that you don't even have them in the house, and it's blowing you out, right? Go to an ACDC DC concert sometime. 110 in front of house with one of the guitar players on. Yeah, that didn't work out so well for them. <laughs> <laughs> if only he wasn't wearing those shorts. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, stereo versus mono. What are the advantages? I told you yesterday. We can position things in stereo. With mono, you have to use level to identify one thing over another. So stereo will give you an opportunity to spread things out so it sounds a little bit more natural. A lot of concerts you see, even though they're big venues, will still be either in stereo or surround. There's an immersive sound now coming out. You're going to hear more and more about it. You ever been to an Atmos Dolby Theater? 17 locations where the sound is distributed through. You watch the movie and you see a, a fly on the screen and it's buzzing around your head. It's so weird. I don't think the church is ready for that yet. <laughs> but you might be ready for stereo if you find a room that's conducive to it. When I'm mixing from front of house, I have a stereo rig. I can push everything to the side physically, left and right, a little bit. It doesn't have to be radical. So that the vocal opens up in the middle. And I don't have to do as much EQing in it. It's just more present. So you might want to try that if you have the facility to do that. Some churches are locked in the mono. There's no way for them to do stereo. It's fun. I mean, if God wanted you to hear in mono, he would put an ear in the middle of your forehead. <laughs> and poor Vincent Van Gogh, he wished he was born that way. <laughs> we talked about high pass filters yesterday. This is a big, big deal. It'll make your mixes cleaner. It'll get rid of all the rumble in the low end that you get from just about every mic on this stage. The only thing you don't apply it to is low frequency instruments. And if you have a variable high pass filter, then you can even high pass bass guitars and kick drums so that they don't go too low. A six string bass can go sometimes below what my subwoofer can reproduce. So I have my high pass filter 40, 50 hertz. Everything below it is getting cut out so my bass is tighter. But on a conventional mixer, conventional instruments, <coughs> HPF, low cut, a little division sign with number it, all that stuff is high pass filters. Put it on every channel, except low frequency, kick drum, bass guitar. If you have a, and we know what a Leslie is, Hammond B3, oh, yeah. so the bottom rotors, don't high pass that. Are you miking a grand piano? So you have a left hand mic, right, the low strings, up here, you have high, right? Don't high pass the low strings. Just high pass the high strings. Listen to music often. Different styles, different genres. Listen to the music your worship leader listens to. If you know he's listening to these kinds of things, it'll get you more into his head about what kind of sound he's looking for. Watch out. You might be a Zeppelin fan. <laughs> he wants to do a worship song that's very similar to Comfortably Numb. <laughs> we can do the audio, but the lights are kind of concerned about it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> the arrangement, we talked about this ad infinitum, ad nauseum. Um, if the music isn't arranged, you have no shot of getting a good especially a small one. <laughs> but anyway, if the band isn't playing well together, you're not the one who's responsible to fix that. You can't fix that. You can make a bad band louder, but you can't make them better. They're going to have to practice, and your worship leader should be directing them as to what <coughs> to do. Not everybody should be playing at the same time. Play to your skill level. This is more for the worship king. Take ownership of the songs. You know, just because you want to sound like Hillsong United doesn't mean you do. <laughs> you get a clarinet and a stump fill and an accordion guy, and you're trying to do Chris Tomlin songs. It's not going to work. So you might want to consider using some tracks to augment, but I wouldn't use tracks for every song. What I would rather do and see you do is if there's a song you really think is a powerful song for your congregation, do it your own way. 
I'm tired of Christian cover bands, to tell you the truth. Every church I go to now, it's like <coughs> performance is trumping everything else. Instead of taking ownership of the song, well, why, are you, why are we doing this? And why don't we do it in a culture that's our own? Instead of trying to be just like the record. It's crazy. We were in cover band. We hated playing Freebird. Yeah, uh, he was actually in Leonard Skinner. No, no, no. no. I, okay, well, I, I, I did play. Yeah, I, I produced Skinner and Kid Rock, actually. So, uh, I, so I was right. But I can tell you, I, I'll tell you a funny story. The first day that I ever walked into Skinner's rehearsal, um, there were great big cue cards on the floor. And there was this song, there was there was actually a Sweet Home Alabama. It was on cue cards. So I, I went, is it that bad? Really? Can you memorize the song? Yeah. I played we got to get past this. You guys know my pet peeve now. This is being looking at stuff. <laughs> and there was seriously cue cards all over the floor. I said, this is going to have to get cleaned. For a song that they wrote? I'm pretty sure. Yeah, that was back in the drug days. Uh, so the things have cleaned up quite a bit. Again, what's going to help control your mix is we use the appropriate size instruments for the room that we're in. You know, if I go into a 100-seat Methodist church with wooden pews and stained glass, I definitely don't want to see this or this in there. We're in a portable church. It's small. I can't get any of that stuff in my little ch tiny church. So drums, we're using a djembe, a cajon, shakers. You mic it up, it sounds great. Unplugged, acoustic, small amps. Bigger rooms, this won't even work in bigger rooms. A lot of big churches are putting this stuff in closets, off stage, isolating it. We're building ISO boxes on the stage. So the cabinet goes in there with a mic to close the lids, and you don't hear it on the stage so much. Or amp modelers, line six, tax <coughs> effects, things that emulate boutique amplifiers that aren't really an effect, but they sound like this through the PA, and there's no noise on the stage. There's electronic drums, which you can also lower the level of, but again, we were talking about that yesterday, a lot of drummers don't prefer to play them. So instead of using a giant kit or an electronic kit, just get a smaller kit. There's a lot of beautiful kits out there now that are built for tone. Let's see if I can show you one. A friend of mine named Joey Parrish used to play drums for uh, Chris Tomlin, and now he's a drum designer, and he plays with Shane and Shane a lot. You ever heard of Shane and Shane? There's nothing wrong with electronic drums if you just work with them to get the sound right. Yeah, again, that's true. And if the drummer likes playing, that, that's, that's cool. But a lot of drummers don't like hard rubber. They like softer mesh heads. So some drum companies now are actually making, like Evans, for instance, makes a silent mesh head you can put on that drum set. It doesn't make any noise. It's how to get sound out of it. They trigger samples with it. So a lot of drummers just like the feel and the look of it. They say, we can Play eight little rubber pads. I don't want to do that. It's like playing a video game to an actual musician. You wouldn't ask, you know, your keyboard player to play on a plastic Casio that they bought at Best Buy. But this is this is something I'm talking about. Right here. That kick is only 14 inches big. What's it sound like? Though? A monster. We actually had it at the Anaheim uh, Convention Center, yeah. and we set it up. It was, we were thinking of not even bringing it in. Yeah. We we set it up and it just went. And people just went, Woof. and they they all came over. And it all goes into a duffel bag. Yeah. yeah. The snare drum is actually a djembe top with snares on the bottom, so you can play it as a djembe and put the snares on and use it as a snare box. They're all 14 inches, so the kick, the floor tom, and the snare are 14, and they all actually go get into a backpack, <coughs> or they go into a roller case, and they just go one, two, three. You put Mike's side thing, it sounds. I've seen this on big, they did the Langer Conference at one of the biggest churches in Dallas, and that was the drum set. And when they mic'd it up, it sounded like the biggest kick drum I've ever heard in my life. It is a monster. <laughs> but you could play it in a coffee house with no microphone, and it would be perfect, appropriate. How would you mic them? Putting one in the hole, overhead, <coughs> snare. Does the overhead take care of the hi-hat? That overhead could actually take care of the whole kit. I heard the kick through the, the overhead, because it's a good overhead. And like, I can play you a million jazz records that are two microphones. You got one red and a kick. You got one on the right, right? Yeah. Oh. So anyway, that's just a. They're 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 made by a guy named Joey Parrish. Joey Parrish drums. He's got a website. I know people spend more on shields than they would on a drum kit. Uh, we're, 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 
You can't overpower the room with that drum. Yeah. It's just it's not Neil Peart's drum set. <laughs> right. Anyway. EQ. Corrective EQ is fixing a problem. If you can, I just wanted to let you know. You can only do so much with EQ. Before you ever touch an EQ, move the microphone. Move it back, move it closer, angle it off axis, pull it back. Try some different things. Have somebody on the stage who's moving microphones for you, and you won't have to do this so much. Another thing that church has fallen into the habit of is they tried to do all the EQing even for the room through channel EQ or through a graphic on the board. Tune your speakers to the room. You know those people who will do that? Yeah. yeah we, got, we got guys. We got guys. I, you, you. So if you get these so they're tuned for the particular space that they're in the position properly in the room, you'll find you won't have to EQ that thing nearly as much. Because it's done here. You guys heard of uh, real-time analyzer? You know what that is? Yeah. yeah. Everybody should actually have that on their phone. Because not only is it a good way to help tune your room, but it's also a good way for you to find the frequencies that are ringing in your monitors, okay? <coughs> and all of a sudden you set it up, and you turn up your monitor, and you're like, you got to go and go, oh, that's, uh, that's 250. You'll start to learn exactly where those are, but your RTA will show you and go, oh, that's exactly where it is. And you can go specifically if you would like to go to a channel and bring it down, or you could go specifically to the EQ that's on that particular aux, and bring that down, or you might find that that's actually a system that's inherently set <coughs> in your entire room, which uh, 200 tends to build up, 250 tends to build up inside of most rooms, and typically if you go and you look at a curve, you'll find them to, them to be bumped down, uh, even if somebody that knows anything so about it. So that's a good point, so on a channel, uh, for channel basis, you might see a lot of the channels that are pulled 250, 300 hours, right. but if you tune your speaker so 300 is pulled out, I won't have to do it there. Then flat works. Uh, okay. But we are, I'm also talking about having an actual reference microphone. Everybody makes one. They're, they're, they're decent. Uh, I don't think Yamaha makes one. I found one thing that they don't make. <laughs> they make tennis rackets? <laughs> they don't. Yeah. They, don't. Yeah. Yeah. they well, bring tennis on. rackets, <laughs> PA systems, keyboard. Motorcycles. Motorcycles. Yeah. Yeah. They do. They make yeah. motorcycles. Yeah. Wave runners. <laughs> outboard engines. <laughs> But no measurement, Mike. <laughs> so you do, you do want to actually get used to. Yeah, I mean, get used. It'll get, it'll get you into the game, and it'll help you start understanding frequencies. If you do get a reference microphone, you know, you, you can get one of the Presonus hundred dollar ones. I don't know what they cost, fifty bucks. Or whatever. Yeah, something like that. Um, and, and, and then start using uh, obviously smart. Smart actually comes. They're on sale. That's good. <laughs> um, so you know, you start uh, equating. Uh, that, that visually, you can actually visually see what offending frequencies there are in the room, and you'll start learning them yourself. The greatest monitor guys in the world can walk out and hear that, and they'll pull it back right now. Yeah. So. You can't see them. No, like, lean Jimmy out. So it's a good thing you can hear me because he keeps tripping over the mic. Anyway, um, all he do is nothing more than volume control. It's a volume control. So when you push a fader up, you're pushing the gain up on all the frequencies. But if you turn up <coughs> the mids in a certain frequency, you just turn the volume up on that band of frequencies. Or cut the gain up. That's all it is. It's a volume control. So if you set your gain and then you start boosting all these things, you just affected your gain structure in a big way. So here's another little rule for you. <coughs> Try to find offending frequencies and pull them out rather than try to find frequencies that you think are going to complement the sound by boosting them. Find the ones that are getting in the way of the sound and remove them. Kick drums, 250, 300, 350, 400. That's what makes those things sound like oatmeal boxes. If you find that particular frequency that's getting in the way of a real good kick drum sound, pull it out. Not necessarily about boosting things that you think are going to make it sound better. Finding frequencies that are getting in the way. Kind of like the veil. The Holy of Holies. The veil was torn in two and it revealed the Holy of Holies. If you remove the offending frequency, you're going to hear the sound like it's really supposed to sound. Hey, I want to throw one thing at you, though. No. There's, 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 speaking of offending things, 
if your if your worship leader has guitar strings that have been on the guitar for a year, <laughs> and somehow or another you just can't find the sound going through the PA, it starts with your source. It does start with your drum heads. It starts with your guitar strings, your bass strings. It starts with good singing, yeah. right, Doug? Sister Lucy. Yeah, we can't do anything with her. No. But has she ever heard the coffee ministry? She's the pastor's wife. <laughs> I can't do anything with her. <laughs> Doug, uh, uh, hi, Pastor. Uh, I heard my wife this morning. Oh, but that new one went yet, huh? After the third time, I don't work no more. Hey, Doug. Give her the red light. She gets the red light. No! Oh! 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 Are they going to have real time auto tune? Yeah. We're building right into the mic. Sister Lucy. charts like this, so this is called independentrecording.net, and this chart is actually interactive, so if you slide through some of the instruments, they'll show you all the fundamental frequencies, all the harmonics, all the strengths, where it's weak, where it's strong, and it's a good thing to do. I told you about a little program yesterday called um, Hear EQ on your phone, where you actually would test your uh, ability to identify frequencies in the mix. There's also another one I didn't say about called Quiz Tone. Q-U-I-Z-T-O-N-E-S. Um, I think it's just for Mac or for iPhone, but um, it's like two bucks. What's cool about Quiz Tone, it'll test your ability to identify frequencies too, but it'll also test your ability to identify timbre. What's timbre? Tone. Oh, here's an example. I got a trumpet, and I'm playing 440 hertz, which is concert pitch. A on a piano is <coughs> the A above middle C is 440 hertz. Middle C is actually about 262 hertz thereabouts. The interesting thing about frequency though is when you go up an octave to the next day, that's 880. If I go down this way, 220, 110, 55. So I can I can figure a lot about frequency just by pounding notes out on a keyboard. If you have a little frequency reader, you can see where it's coming up on your RTA. But timbre is different from frequency away. Same frequency, but it's a different sound. So why does A440 on a trumpet sound different from A440 on a piano? <coughs> it's a brass instrument, I'm blowing air into it. Piano, I'm hitting a string, it's resonating in this big wooden chamber. Violin 440 sounds different from a viola hit 440. That's timbre. So it's also going to test you on that. It's also going to test you on level. Are we boosting this by 6 or 9 degrees? Now, if you get down to the advanced stage of that, they're actually cutting things by 3 dB. And if you can hear that, you've arrived. Because not too many people can hear cuts at 3 dB. <laughs> That's very minimal. What's this, John, what's the smallest we can discern as a human? 3 dB? Well, it's supposed to be 1. It's supposed to be 1? Yeah, but that's like, like, total a, quiet. like a 1 year old baby. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah. by the time we're a little older, we start to lose some of our hearing. So okay. all bets are off. <laughs> That's when we become lighting guys. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're teachers. I don't mix anymore because I don't hear the hybrid. Yeah. I'm 65 and I played in rock bands too. Yeah. So I'm going to lose it as I get older. So they, what's that old saying? Those who do, do. And those who can't, each do. So I don't mix anymore. I'll burn people's hair off. Because I don't hear, I don't hear the highs. <laughs> he makes his hair off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Doug, have you thought about the coffee ministry? <laughs> Even do that last rotten rug I had. Yeah. <laughs> Got it from Carpet Giant. Yeah, three bucks. <laughs> um, anyway, learn about your EQ and the way it works. There's different types of EQs, obviously. There's uh, fixed EQ, which is our most affordable mixers. You'll have maybe a high EQ that's fixed to a certain frequency that you can boost or cut. And that's called that's called a shelf. Get out of here for a minute. And I'll, I'll probably close with this, but just to give you an idea, let's do uh, Okay, so can everybody see that okay? 
So I told you what a high pass filter was, right? And this is a high pass, so I'm taking the lows off. And this is variable, so I can take it all the way up to, you know, wherever, 1K. If I did that and you heard a microphone, I would sound like Mickey Mouse. Hi, how are you doing today? That's a nice trick to find your past or something. <laughs> um, so that's a high pass filter. And some people don't have high pass, so you could actually use your low EQ, <coughs> even if it's a fixed one, like at 100 hertz. If you don't have a high pass filter, take your base EQ, your low EQ, and just attenuate it, roll it out. It'd be the same thing as a high pass filter. That make sense? Okay. So, anybody have a car stereo? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> On your car stereo, I mean, some of the more elaborate ones now have EQ on them, but the old days we just had bass and treble. And before that was just tone. <laughs> That's a nice tone right there. <laughs> you okay? Yeah, <laughs> probably. So, the type of EQ that you see on a portable mixer that just has a high and a low and it's fixed are called shelf EQs. You know how shelf EQs are? So if I had the low on a shelf <coughs> and I boosted it, Watch what happens. What frequency am I boosting? A large level. I'm boosting everywhere from the center point is set at about 100. Mm -hmm. And I'm boosting everything down to 20. That's what your mixer with just a low EQ does. So if you boost the bass, you just boosted everything down to 20 hertz. Mm -hmm. So what would be a more useful function for a low EQ on a mixer like that? as a cut. And same thing on the high EQ. Your high EQ is a shelf too. So if I turn that on and I boost, let's say I'm going to boost, what are they typically on like the portable mixers? 8K, 10K? Okay, so let's bring this up to 10. Thereabouts. And if I boost it, I boost everything out to 20. That's what happens when you boost low or high on those mixers. You're boosting both ranges down to their extremes or up to their extremes. See how that would not be useful as a boost? Um, so we're going to probably use that as a cut too. Now the problem with this is they are fixed frequencies. I can't change at what point they start to work. That's where semi-parametrics come. So now with semi-parametric, this allows me to Let's do the same This allows me to sweep the frequencies where I want it to work. It allows me to move the frequencies around. Where do I need this thing to start working? And then you can boost or cut. So let's say I want to boost or cut 253. Cut it. And I do that while I'm listening. Somebody's playing and I'm moving it around and I hear something weird. Now, that's a semi-parametric. I can move the frequencies around, and I can boost, or I can cut. What's the fully parametric? Which range or width you look at your... That's right, that, that's called the Q. So Q allows me to make that cut more surgically narrow, so I don't leave a hole in the music. Or if I was to boost something, I can make it a little bit wider so it blends in with the other things around it, so it's not sticking out like a sore thumb. <coughs> <laughs> Those are the different types of EQ that most mixers have on the channel. We give you all of them, as most digital mixer companies do. The low and high can be either a fixed, I mean a <coughs> shelf, or they can be a P. But I can even do a, uh, a low like that too, if I took the shelf. See what I mean? What's the major? Shelf and parametric? A high pass filter. A high pass filter? Yeah, yeah. what's the difference? You won't, a high pass filter is usually separate from the EQ section. It's still a pretty much a, a shelving EQ right. that I can vary from a certain range on the low end right. to cut, cut it out. So now, most mixers don't have a low pass filter. 
but you can use your high EQ in a shelf as a high pass. Let me give you for instance. So let's say I have a flute. Does anybody know the range of a flute? Fundamental, bottom frequency to the top there at all? Well, the bottom would be, you could get down as low as 250, 300 hertz with a flute. And it goes up 7, 8K, somewhere. So if I have a microphone, it's a condenser, and it's over the flute, and there's a kick drum over here, the drum set, and I want to eliminate that kick drum from getting in that microphone because it will get into it, what I can do is make the microphone work on the frequencies of a certain instrument. So what I might do is say, all right, I'm going to take my high pass filter up to 250. So I just cut off all the low end that's going to get into that microphone. Now, what's the top end of the fruit? Uh, fruit? <laughs> what's the top end of the fruit? You, you, pray, you, you pray the fruit? <laughs> I'm going to bring this down to about 7K, 8K, somewhere there, and I'm going to cut it. So I've just carved out a section that the microphone on the flute is looking at and try to ignore the rest. Are you still going to get some stuff? Yeah, because the slopes aren't extreme. They go off like that, <coughs> gently. But now the microphone's not picking up all the frequencies that it's possible to hear. It's focusing on the ones that the flute's producing. And we use EQ a lot of that way to, even in drums. How do you mic the drum set? Well, some people use an overhead like I do to get the whole drum sound. Some people use it just for the metal. So if you're using it just for cymbals, you might high pass your your um, your cymbals up to like, I don't know, 450, 500. So now the microphones on the cymbals are just getting the, the frequencies of the cymbals and not all the drums underneath. Follow Make sense? But you can only do that with parametrics. Even on most mixers I've mentioned before with fixed high and low, they give you they might give you a mid-range sweep. Not really. They might even just give you it might be a sweep of like centered at 1K. And then there's a cutter boost. But that's not very useful either. <laughs> right? Hey, no, it's very so good. don't depend just on the mixer to do everything. Choose the right mic, put it in the right place, see how that sounds, and then Use EQ either complementary or correctly to try to make the mic work the way it's supposed to. If that doesn't work, get, get new talent. <laughs> I'm sorry, you're, you're, you're on. <laughs> Next. Well, the other thing is don't use it. Don't use an RE20 on your flute. It's easy. Yeah, right. You want to use what you were talking about yesterday, like a, a, a um, like an AT451 or something like that. It's a good yeah. condenser microphone, and that goes well with that. Because remember something else, organically, yeah, you did eliminate the low end going into that microphone because you told it. That. But remember, an organic drum produces a lot more than just a yeah, 100 hertz. Right. It actually has a low and a top end. Right. And if it doesn't, you need to go get new drum heads, right? If you're recording, you might be concerned about bleed from other things. That's why multi-tracking, they'll do tracks individually. Sometimes you want the whole band in a room. Play a, lots of Rolling Stones and Beatles records where that happened. And, there was magic to it. And so live sound, you're always going to get bleed. You're never going to prevent everything. But some of these techniques will help you isolate things a little bit. Yeah. Did somebody have a question? Is time up, David? You can go. No? I don't care. Um, speakers in the right place. I go into church, I see speakers on the back wall, the pulpit's 20 feet in front of it. We get feedback. Yeah. I can see that. You can see that? Oh, yeah. Your microphone's in front of the speaker. So what should we do? Um, pull the, <coughs> put the pulpit back there. That will help. Get them away from your sidewalls. Get them away from corners. Every time you load a speaker on the wall, you're going to get more bottom end. Now, if you're looking for more bottom end because you really can't afford a subwoofer, put it in a corner that will give you anywhere from 12 to 18 dB more bottom end. It will sound like you know, you want to get the speakers away from walls so they don't load, they don't couple. Um, never point a microphone at a speaker. 
you want to have people hear it, then aim the speakers at their ears, not at other parts of their body. And that goes for churches too. So when you have a speaker on a stand, aim straight out like this, it's going to go straight over people and bounce off the wall and everything else. Now, that's okay if that's all you have, but it would be better if you could get it up. You'd cover more area. You might need a little more amplifier power to do that because it's further away from the listener, but at least it's aimed at people and not at once. So suspended speakers are okay? What? Suspended speakers are... I, well, you get, you get better coverage. That's all. Um, and depending on the kind of speaker that is, that's something you have to consider too. Is it a point source speaker? I mean, when you need to cover the room. The whole idea of a PA system is to get even coverage so everybody can hear the same thing at, at a level that's appropriate. If you're trying to fill a room that's 80 feet long with two speakers on stand in front, you're going to blast the people out here in front, and they're not going to hear you in the back. So if you set some speakers up in the back, then there's another thing you have to think about, is delaying them. Because if you set two speakers up 40 feet from these, and they play at the same time, then the people back there are going to hear those immediately, then 40 milliseconds later, they're going to hear something else. It's not discernible as an echo, but your brain discerns it as something not right. It doesn't, that's not right. I'm hearing like me. <clears throat> so you got to fix that. I see so many churches that put speakers all around, even have them facing each other. So the two are facing, and then these two rear ones are facing the other way, in the back of your head. I don't know why. Make sure your amplifiers, if they're not powered, everybody know what a powered loudspeaker is? The amplifier is actually built into the to the speaker cabinet. Then there's passive speakers which require amplifiers. I see a lot of churches that have the amplifiers back in front of the house, and then they're connecting like the zip line, 300 feet, <laughs> to passive speakers in front. The shortest distance is always the best thing for virtually any cable. The right length. So put your amplifiers closer to the speakers and run shorter speaker cables to them. That make sense? No. I'm not making sense at all. I think you're doing great. Thanks. So we talked about inverse square law. No. We didn't bring that oh, up. Oh, there's room for ten more things here. <laughs> We actually talked a lot more than 20, didn't we? Yeah. So we should yeah, probably just forget to use the You You're loading them down pretty good. <laughs> what are the main indicators for using wireless? Why would you use a wireless mic instead of a wired mic? Uh, mobility. And I don't want to hear it it's so much cooler. Safety. 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 Mobility. You brought up safety. 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 In a baptismal, I would agree. <laughs> <laughs> if you're standing in water, wirelesses are safe. <laughs> well, I'm sure you all heard about David Crowder's pastor some years ago, who died in a baptismal in front of 800 people. His name was Kyle Lake. He was 33 years old. He had three kids. And the reason he died wasn't because of the, of the wired microphone. It was because somebody did a do-it-yourself water heater in a baptismal, and current was in the water. So when he reached for a microphone, which was grounded properly, current found ground through his chest. And he died. And imagine you're waiting in line to be baptized. <laughs> 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 Yeah, wireless and water is probably a safe bet, just in case the water heater wasn't grounded properly. That should have never, they, start, they tried to blame the microphone. I was working for sure at that time, that's how I heard about the story. And I was a friend of David Crowder. He told me, and he thought it was sure his fault. I said, not our fault. Something's in that water. You know that voltage doesn't kill you, right? Current. Mobility is the reason. The 
person has to move. That's what I would consider wireless. Work. If you're a piano player to sitting at a bench, you're not getting a wireless. Drummer, wireless, why? Unless you're for king and country or something. Those guys yeah. marching <laughs> around. Yeah. They're excited when we get. I'll give them wireless. The USC marching band. You know? Yeah, they get. <coughs> guys still playing the guitar. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Aesthetics, that's not a good reason either. Because there's so many different ways to cover cables and to organize cables so they're dressed properly. Reliability is the main thing you should be looking for. What's going to work? Blue Man Group in Las Vegas has over 100 inputs on the console. Only three of them are wireless. Why? Because in a Vegas theater, you got everybody with wireless in the whole city. What make you even find frequencies that work? People are paying 200 bucks for a ticket, and they don't want any of the mics to go down. No battery issues, no antenna issues, no frequency coordination issues. It works, and it's less expensive. Now, I've worked for Audio Technica, too. Make great wireless system. And if you need wirelessers, by all means, go for it. But know the reasons why you're doing it. And if your money has the budget to afford them, great. I'm in a portable church, so Wireless is make a lot of sense for us because I don't have to lay a lot of cables on. I can hand four wireless transmitters to the singers, turn them on. But the batteries better be good. And I better not have any interference today since the FCC squashed my spectrum. <coughs> Where do we mix the service from? When you go to a concert, where is the mixed position for front and front? In the middle of the crowd. Two thirds of the way back, in the middle. Where is it in most churches? In a corner with a glass screen in front of it. <laughs> Up in a balcony, the speakers are basically this. The guy's above the speaker when he's mixing. Yeah, it's not good either. We have a window that's like five feet high that there's a ton of room. We are definitely given the most impossible places to do this from here, but we are now given iPads. So, so, yeah, so now you can actually put a digital mixer in a closet and sit with your wife and mix if you want. Just make sure she's in the middle of the room, too. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's critical because you have to be where the people are hearing it to make corrections. And if you have to keep walking downstairs and upstairs or get around the glass, that's okay for recording, maybe. If it's a real isolated room, great for recording, but not for mixing a Uh, do drum shields work? I guess we're going to know the answer to that. No! <laughs> What's in a monitor mix? We learned that yesterday. The essentials in a monitor mix are to hear yourself, to have a tempo reference, and to get a Especially like with new people on the team. Here's a, a girl who sang in my service, and I don't know how many of you have ever recorded your voice in the recording studio. Anybody? Remember the first time you did it? And then playing it back and you're going like, what? <laughs> that is not me. So you're hearing your voice, which you hear in your head all the time, being transmitted to you via a loudspeaker through air, right? So there's this girl, and she says, I can't hear myself at all. Really? So I'm starting to take stuff out of the mix that she doesn't need. So now I'm down to like keyboards and drums, and that's it. So I go up and I stand and, and she's singing. I'm going, well, that, that's you right there. <laughs> so I made a recording of her in the studio and I bumped her vocal way up in it and I printed a CD for her. I said, listen to this all week. Get used to it because that's your voice. So it's not so much a matter of level or EQ, it's a matter of who am I in that thing. And the more stuff that I would put in that mix, the more confused the person would be. They don't do it often enough to understand it. <coughs> Be aware of all the personal things that could happen to make that not work either. Just like the guitar relationship, right? And like both of you guys said, come up to the stage and listen to what they're hearing. You can't hear it from back there. You can't make corrections for them from back there. You gotta, and with wireless mixing again, I could actually stand next to the talent now and adjust it just the way they want it while I'm sitting here listening to it. That's the beauty of that. Okay? That's it.
free to go this minute.